Winners and not winners, my name is Pridium, and welcome to the off-season of Survivor. The birds are chirping, the sun is shining, and anything goes. With a likely bright future ahead of us, glaringly so, I thought it would be fun to sit down and muse over many different winners in the history of Survivor. I don't really know why, I just kind of felt like it. Maybe we'll see you on again someday? Yes, I hope so. That's that's the rumor. So um, I would love to do... Um like an all winners because then it'd be an even playing field. Um, otherwise you become quite the target and people want to take you out first. Oh, yeah. So hopefully we have an all winners. This isn't going to be a top five or top 10. Instead, I will be spending the next few weeks discussing what I believe to be the most ingenious moves made by winners in the history of Survivor. I am talking about moves that require a little bit of thinking outside of the box that were maybe creative or different, unusual, or original. Basically synonyms for the word ingenious. Because hot damn, a lot of Survivor's winners are geniuses, and with this video, Let's give them a little bit of kudos. This video series is going to be a celebration of Survivor's winners and the ingenuity they have brought to the game. The series won't be a ranking so much as a long list of greatness. I will be discussing five moves in this video as well as 15 more down the line, likely in three parts, but we'll see. And there's no significant order to my reveal, but feel free to rank the moves as you see fit. Regardless, let's get this party started by not talking about anything else for the rest of the video. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, we have a video to get to. The first big overarching ingenious move of the 20 that I will be talking about was actually very outside of the usual box that I think the producers would like every person they cast to be placed in. The proverbial confessional booth, revealing your innermost thoughts and strategies and opinions on everything happening in the game. One move from a winner that is rather all-encompassing is when Danny Boatwright from Survivor Guatemala chose not to reveal her strategies or really much of anything at all to the producers as the game played out episode by episode. You know, I don't think you can trust anybody in this game, so that's why you always have to stay on your toes and why you don't want to leave anybody to with an opportunity to really talk. You know, I don't know, every day is different. We know how that goes and how things can just unfold. So, but right now, if that works for tonight, that would be huge, It'd be so big. So, we'll crack the alliance. <laughs> While many players in Survivor are infrequently highlighted, or in some cases not highlighted at all, going purple in the face, in the case of Danny, she actively chose to hide herself not just from the rest of her cast, but from the producers as well. I consider this decision to be low-key ingenious because it allowed her game to be a total question mark to the only other people in the game, the people behind the cameras, who could ever truly know her strategy. You see, when you sign up to be on Survivor, it is expected of you to perform in a game that will be broadcast to millions of people around the country. The downside to that, if that is an upside, however, is that while you are performing for the cameras, the producers behind the cameras will become privy to everything only you would know. Whether you choose to tell your fellow tribe mates certain information or not should be up to you, but it is the producer's job to ask leading questions to those same tribe mates, to which maybe they will be able to read between the lines or infer more from the questions asked than you as a player would be comfortable with. Mind you, this isn't a revelation, it's, it's pretty common knowledge. I mean, Big Brother literally has a diary room where this stuff has happened live for the audience to watch. But with Danny Boatwright, she purposefully chose to give the producers very little to work with so that they couldn't unintentionally tip off her competitors while she was in pursuit of being the sole survivor. She even said herself that she was picking up bits of information about everyone else in the game by reading between the lines when she sat down to have one-on-one -on -one interviews with the producers, and because of that, right away, her new strategy was born. While I can't say to what extent this strategy worked out for her, I do still think it is one of the most intentionally ingenious ways to play the game, even if it probably nullified her into obscurity back in the editing suite. You told me the producers hated you. <laughs> I didn't give them a lot of what questions they were asking. I just kind of gave them the ho-hum answer because I felt like some of the questions I was being asked, I could kind of figure out 
what was going on in the game. So I was very careful what I said. You didn't even want the producers to know how you were playing the game? Yeah, yeah. So no. you played it I was super just, close to the I was so, I'm so competitive and I wanted to win so badly that I was really guarded in some of the things that I would say because I just wanted to protect my game. I didn't fly into the radar, I beat the radar. It's one thing to fly under or maybe even beat the radar, but what about when you're flying so high that you're visibly at the top from miles away? I'm actually not sure if that's how radars work, but either way, the next winner I wanna highlight is Yule Kwan from Survivor Cook Islands. While Yule had several fantastic moves that season, such as saving Becky in the pre-merge or utilizing his hidden immunity idol to flip Jonathan Penner at the final nine, what I really loved about Yule Kwan was his consistent pandering to the jury all while trying to pass it off as nothing more than being a nice guy. A polite guy. A political guy. Yule's move at the final seven to blindside Penner was ingenious, if only because it ultimately won him the game. I mean, okay, a lot of moves he made won him the game, but when he specifically spoke with Adam about voting off Penner at that point, Adam made a deal and said that if Yule was able to get Penner voted off at the final seven instead of Adam or Parvati, then Adam would vote for Yule to win the game if he was in a position to do so. While the I24 Alliance likely all agreed to take out Penner, it wasn't just Yule. I gotta give props to Yule here. Penner was likely an easy beat in the end, despite whatever threats were thrown Yule's way to the contrary, and it would have been pretty easy for Yule to keep Penner around as a possible endgame losing finalist. Despite Penner pleading to Yule to not do anything stupid, Yule instead took up Adam's offer and won himself an easy jury vote at no cost to his own game. And likewise, in the very next episode, Yule continued to subtly pander to the jury by bringing Penner's hat and giving it back to him as he sat on the jury, a move that Probst declared <laughs> right after it happened to be quite bold and unique. Bringing back somebody's favorite hat could easily turn somebody into, you know what, at least he brought me my hat. Absolutely. And Yule has been playing this game to win votes, I think, from the beginning. Yule has been playing this game seamlessly. Yule was straight up playing the ideal role of a politician in a game all about social politics. Who'd have thunk? I consider this pandering to be ingenious because not only did it win him the game, but in most cases, especially in more modern Survivor, you oftentimes see players who make attempts to win over the jury, instead resulting with the opposite effect. Yule made several subtle moves throughout the season to appease the jury where it mattered most, which I would argue is the best way to account for getting a juror's vote, if you can manage it. Figure out exactly what they want, and then just give it to them. If you're capable enough, as Yule clearly was, you may be able to pull off getting their vote for you in the end. Yule's vote off of Penner, only to then appease him moments later, is some of the most noticeable jury management we may ever get to see, and it deserves a mention on this list. Amazingly, you use Jonathan in voting Jonathan out as a way to potentially help you win this game. You said to Yule that if you get rid of Jonathan before me or Parvati, that I'll give you my votes exactly. in the end. Exactly, and if not, I would have voted for Ozzy. So. And did you keep your word? Yep. And another credit to you, Yule, for doing something that I don't think people realized you were doing, which was playing everybody so in such subtle ways. It's a tiny little maneuver, but it seemed to pay off. I think at some point, people started calling me the puppet master, and I was trying to find, and I was trying to convince them I'm not the puppet master. I mean, the way I like to work with the group is to build consensus, but at some point, I realized they're gonna think I'm, you know, BSing about it. So, right, fine, if you think I'm the puppet master, I'll take that and use it to my advantage. And speaking of being a mob boss, as Yule was, what if you actually could be a mob boss in real life? You know, making hits, organizing your own personal army? of zombies, of prisoners. Okay, maybe not in real life, but you know, hey, some people say Survivor blurs the line between real life and a game. The next ingenious move is so exemplary of this video subject that I would say it almost needs no introduction or explanation, and it speaks for itself. It's Boston Rob from Survivor Redemption Island when he created the buddy system, as he called it, a strategy among his tribe where of the six people in his alliance, everyone would have their own buddy to hang out with, to keep in check, to report back to the group if anything were to go awry. The buddy system was designed to ensure that nobody would break from the alliance, as is quite common in Survivor. It's intended to put the success of the group over the success of the individual, 
Because in theory, if nobody strays off the path, everyone should win. Or in this case, Boston Rob should win. I have a whole vision that I'm trying to put into action here. I want my group to hate Zapatera. It's us versus them, and we're better than them. And we're gonna be arrogant about it, and we're gonna show it. I'm not, but I want them to. Rob essentially created a series of Prisoner's Dilemmas, a standard game often analyzed in game theory that pits two players against one another for their individual benefit. The Prisoner's Dilemma is basically if one person snitches on the other, they will benefit tremendously and the person they snitched on won't, which means that neither participant should, in theory, stray from the path lest they be snitched on. If both players remain complicit and don't deviate, they should both equally benefit in the end, which is exactly what we saw with the three pairs all making the final six in this season. And if both people in this prisoner's dilemma deviate, they both take the risk of being snitched on, thus hurting their position. Mind you, the catch to all of this is that the warden in this prisoner's dilemma is actually one of the prisoners all along, the Kaiser Soze, you could say. It's Rob. Disguised as a prisoner, he enacts the plan to keep everyone in check, knowing it's an ingenious strategy that should not only get him to the end of the game, but also put himself in a position where he is at the front of the pack. All information funnels up to him as the leader, despite being masked as someone who is in the exact same spot as the rest of them. Rob won the game by coasting through the post-merge on this strategy, and as far as ingenious moves go, yeah, it, it's got to be up there. We, we've tossed around the idea of trying to uh, see if we can woo some of the Ometepe tribe, but Rob's got him on such lockdown. I mean, he's like the uh, he's like the prison guard. So Natalie just came and told me that Ralph approached Ashley and said that if she makes it to the top three, that he's voting for her. Ashley, you could have made it to the end, but you decided not to tell me anything. You have to tell me everything. It's my game. I'm in charge. Unless, of course, it is hidden somewhere in the Kagian jungle, in a makeshift shack, or maybe even a bunker. This next move, or strategy, or just bizarre concept is one of my favorites, though I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it's some game-winning strategy. I am talking about Tony Vlakos making a shack in Season 28 Survivor Kagian where he would hide amidst the branches and the debris to spy on his tribe mates and hear what they were saying. Basically, Tony was paranoid because he blindsided one of his allies in the previous episode, and to remedy that, he decided to hide in a bush and eavesdrop for crucial information. I don't even know what to say to that, or how that blueprint of an idea was the first thing Tony decided to do, but it happened. And I'm glad it happened, and I think Survivor is better off for it happening. The water well is here, there's a tree there, and I put some bushes and some shrubs and some broken branches where I can hide right in that, and I'm within five feet away. That's where I'll be the most patient when I'm sitting in my spy shack. This spy shack, which later evolved into a spy bunker in Survivor Game Changers, wasn't anything I would say revolutionary as far as gameplay goes, but I do think it took some kind of mad scientist ingenuity to concoct it, to think of it in the first place, and turn it into a reality. And for that, it absolutely needs to be mentioned. Although, I will just say spoilers for the next parts, it definitely won't be the last of Tony that we get to see. After you see the votes, you can use it. <sighs> Everybody's eyes say, Bee! You know how powerful that is? Oh, I'm gonna show you how powerful that is. And then lastly, for part one, we get to a follow-up move that maybe wasn't altogether original, but I do think it took an already played out move and improved upon it, even if neither time the move happened, it worked out. In Survivor Karamoan, we saw Malcolm Freeberg and his trusty amigos attempt the strong arming of taking out Philip Shepard by playing two idols at the same time, as well as one of the amigos, Reynolds, being immune from the challenge. Malcolm declared to everyone that they were going to be voting for Philip, which basically gave the opposition an easy out if they wanted to play it safe for the vote instead of cracking at the seams. The idea with Malcolm's move was to take out the leader, hoping the body would fall apart in the aftermath, but because he told them who his target was, he made it easy for the body to remain intact after all was said and done. But four seasons later in Survivor Worlds Apart, 
we saw Mike Holloway go on to pull off a similar move at the final eight when it was just himself and Shirin versus a massive alliance of six. Mike had won immunity and also had an idol in his sock, and it was blatantly obvious that the opposing alliance would be voting for Shirin. She was the easy scapegoat, even though they would have preferred Mike to go, but then again, immunity challenges exist. At the tribal council, Mike pulled out his hidden idol in a similar fashion to Malcolm, but unlike Malcolm, I believe Mike played this situation a lot better. He told the alliance of six, that he was playing the idol for Shirin, she would be safe. And so anyone who voted for her was wasting their vote. But he also never made it clear who he would be voting for and that if you wanted to stay alive after his idol was getting played, you better cast a vote for the next best person to go in the group other than Shirin. Whereas in Survivor Caramoan, Malcolm gave the opposition an easy out, Mike made it more random. And I think that that is a huge difference and I loved it. We're going to see where this six is divided. Shireen's voting for Tyler. I'm voting for one of the other four that doesn't have immunity. And, uh, you take your chances. This really is Survivor Russian Roulette. It resulted in two of the six votes getting cast for Dan, revealing the pecking order, and that Dan was in fact on the bottom. While the move in that season ultimately didn't have a strong effect on the game, I believe the ingenuity of improving upon a half-decent move is absolutely worthy of being on this list. It required a good amount of conviction to pull off, to be believed in, and it worked. It, it did work. He did get votes cast in a different direction, and I could definitely see this move working in the future, especially now that idols are hidden in like every other tree. That's, that's what we do, baby. We do the happy dance. We do the happy dance kidding me right now? But anyway, I've said a lot already that is going to be part one of the most ingenious moves made by Survivor winners. What do you guys think about this list so far? What else should be on this list? I still have 15 more moves to get to and believe me, we are only getting started. It's gonna be a long month. But no matter, my name is Purdy. I'm saying thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to buy a blueprint for your very own spy shack on your way out and I will see you in the next one once I step up my game and go on to build my very own spy fallout shelter. I went to dig a spy bunker next to the water well so I could just go under the ground where nobody's gonna expect it because they're gonna be looking for spy shacks. They ain't gonna be looking for an underground bunker. This game's not worth it if you lose. I would never do it if I don't think I could win.